So good evening, Georgetown. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for those of you who were here last year, you know that we had uh, Bono come talk to you about what he did. And uh, Ann Finucane helped us arrange that through all the hard work she does for our company. And so this year, as I was thinking about with Ann who we should bring in, I actually talked to Bono. And he said, boy, if you want to bring a real rock star, bring Warren Buffett in. <laughs> because here's a guy who has done more for philanthropy than I can ever do, and, and et cetera. So last year we bought your rock star. This year we bought your real rock star. <laughs> So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask for in a series of questions over 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll take your questions in the, in the crowd and, and let the students have a chance to ask Warren about his experiences. And I, I'm going to start a little bit where the president left off, which is this is your hometown. This is a, a part of your hometown. So what are your best memories about being around Georgetown? And, uh, well, I delivered papers at Georgetown Hospital uh, 66 years ago, and uh, uh, I, like, I developed this affinity because in the hospital, uh, people tipped. Uh, <laughs> my, regular, <laughs> my regular customers, the one that knew me, never, never tipped. But, they, uh, but I would go to the hospital, and, and one of the things they would do, uh, they would give me cash tips, but they also would tell me if they were a, a woman that had given birth to a baby that was, we'll say, 8 pounds, 11 ounces, they would whisper that number to me. And the numbers racket was very big in, in Washington that time, and they felt they were giving me this terribly valuable information, the exact time in which the baby was born or something. And I was supposed to bet on that number in the, uh, in the, in the numbers racket that day. So I, I have a lot of memories of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of Georgetown. And uh, uh, I was here during World War II, which was really a fascinating time to be in, in, in Washington. And uh, uh, my dad being in Congress, it, you know, it was, it was really a, a window on an extraordinary time in, in America. And of course, at that time, we were probably more united than at any time in my lifetime about a common goal. I mean, it, uh, that, that was the time when people like Bobby Feller and all the athletes the day the war broke out went down and enlisted and, and people really did voluntarily in a very high percentage uh, play by the rules in terms of gasoline rationing and sugar rationing and meat rationing and all that. And, uh, we all bought savings bonds at, at, uh, at school to, to help out the troops. So it was, it was quite a period. <laughs> well, so somewhere along there you started investing and, <laughs> and uh, changed the nature. And I've read stories that you started investing at 13, or that, that, whether they're true or not, but somewhere around that. And, and it was so 11. <laughs> what, what created the fascination with investing? <laughs> it took me five years. I had to save $120. It took me five years to get the $120 to buy a stock. Uh, three shares of city service preferred when I was uh, 11. I, I just, my dad originally was in the investment business. He really wasn't very interested in it, but I would go down on Saturday morning and, uh, and he had these books there in the office and I read all those and then I went to the Omaha Public Library and I, I read every book on investments in the Omaha Public Library by the time, I was, by the time we moved to Washington. And then when we got here, I had the Library of Congress. <laughs> Did you so, get through all those? Oh, I, I, I read everything. And I, I, I just found it fascinating. And, uh, and incidentally, I find it fascinating today. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an activity. You know, if you're, a, if you're a baseball player or something, you know, if your legs may go or something, well, my legs have long gone. But it doesn't make any difference in what I do. So it's, uh, I have, I, I literally have as much, I always have had fun working, but I have as much fun now as I've ever had in my life. I mean, to uh, work with people, I love doing what I love, and it just doesn't get any better than that. Well, the quote is that you tap, tap dance to work I every tap day? tap dance to work, yeah. And so I mean, what, what makes you do don't, that? Don't ask me to demonstrate, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it was nice to get that round of applause at the start, but I've learned that crowds now applaud at the start because I'm 83 and they're not sure I'll be around at the end of the talk. <laughs> 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 I've, I've shared enough dinners with you know that you have more energy than anybody I, I know. So it's a, let's, let's switch to a little bit on the philanthropy side. So sure. uh, President DeJoya talked about the, the giving pledge. How, how did you come up with the idea with, uh, with Bill, and, and how are you doing on it? I mean, yeah, well, we're doing great. And it, it was, I don't know, three or four years ago, Bill and Melinda and I were out in California and talking, and I'm not exactly sure how it came up, but we decided to call or write David Rockefeller and ask if he would host a dinner in New York uh, for about... 16 or 18 people, just to talk about philanthropy. And uh, Oprah Winfrey came, and, and Mayor Bloomberg was there, and, and it was a private dinner. And, and 
I started having these people talk around the table as to how they developed their philosophy of philanthropy. It must have taken us two and a half hours or so to get around. I mean, people were really interested in it. So uh, Bill and I were at that dinner. We decided that maybe there would be a possibility of, of, of taking this passion which these people show, sh had shown and, and, and going to other uh, people that had a great deal of money and uh, see if we could develop something uh, where people would pledge at least half their net worth. And we now have about 115 people. I've been, I've been dialing for dollars. I, I call these billionaires up, and uh, uh, sometimes they tell me how they can't do it. And I decided, I, I tell them I'm going to write a book on how to live on $500 million, because apparently there's this great <laughs> need. You know, they, they just can't seem to figure out how to do it. And I, they need help. Uh, but it, it's, it's been very rewarding, and, and I, I received a letter from one woman. She and her husband had over $10 billion, and she sent me a tie. She sent me two ties, and she sent me this handwritten note and said that, that uh, they hadn't really faced it. It's a little like facing your own mortality right. to some extent, making that plan, and that's tough for people sometimes. And uh, uh, so she and her husband had changed things, and, and uh, over half of that $10 billion was going to go to philanthropy. They, they, they do tend to postpone the decision, so I tell, these, I tell these people I call, you know, the last will is what counts, but I tell them, you know, are you, if I'm talking to some 70-year-old, do you really think your decision-making ability is going to be better when you're 95 with some blonde on your lap or, or, or now? And so let's get on board, fellas. You know. <laughs> And I assume that that convinces them maybe the 70-year-old decision is better at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, Bill is not a trivia, but Bill has gotten people around the world because he travels more than I do. But uh, uh, what we're hoping is people do pick up on norms. I mean, when I was young, I read about Carnegie and Rockefeller and different people, Bill did too. And, and you do pick up behavior from those who come before. And, and We've collected letters from every one of these people. They're up on our website, at the givingpledge.org, and, and I think they're worth reading. They're, they're pretty remarkable. And of course, what we really want to do is get the younger people, like Mark Zuckerberg's joined us, for example, and, and he obviously is going to appeal to a much wider group than, 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 than I would. Or, uh, uh, so we, are, we hope it becomes you know, this gospel of wealth that Andrew Carnegie uh, came up with 100 years or so ago. That's influenced all kinds of people. Well, we've got better stories than that, you know, on these, on these letters. So I, I just hope it moves. Now, I don't think, I, I want to emphasize one thing. Nobody in our group has given away a dollar that in any way affects how they live. I mean, I have the much greater admiration, frankly, for the person who drops $5 or $1 in a collection plate on Sunday where it makes a difference in whether they go take their kids to a movie or whether they go eat out or something of the sort. They are actually giving up something that has utility to them. I am giving up nothing that has utility to me. I have everything in the world I want that, that, that uh, can be bought by money. And, and uh, so I have a whole bunch of stock certificates. They have no utility to me. And they can possibly have enormous utility right. to other people in vaccines or education or all kinds of things. So the people that give up something that, that actually can have utility to their family and give that to some other person so it has utility to them. I, those are the people I really think deserve uh, the kudos. But it's still nice to go where the money is. I mean, you know, it's, it's the, the Willie Sutton approach. And, and uh, uh, so if we can get, if we can work on polio or something like that, and it, it takes big contributions, then we want to go after it. So I mean, the unique part of what you've done is with uh, Bill and Melinda and their foundation, and, and, and on the one hand, how you're doing it, and secondly, that you've gone and said, whatever the number will be, but most, almost all your wealth. All, all, all my Berkshire right. wealth. And so, and so talk about the Gates relationship and why you chose them as opposed to creating your own foundation. or. or something. Well, originally my wife and I planned when we were in our 20s that when we had everything we needed, we would, we would use the rest for society. And I thought she would outlive me. Uh, she was younger and women lived longer. And then she, she died in 2004. So I had to come up with a different plan. And, you know, if you've read Adam Smith and the specialization of labor, you know that, you know, that if, you're, if you're good at one thing, you're not necessarily good at another. And you ought to get the person, you ought to use your talents where they're most useful and get other people to give their talents. So, you know, when my wife had babies, I mean, I went to an obstetrician. I didn't deliver myself. When I get a toothache, I go to a dentist. So I wanted to go to people who were very good at giving away money 
and who were younger, energetic, smart, and had the same objectives in philanthropy that I did. And, and the basic principle of the Gates Foundation is that every human life has equal value. And if you start with that as your basic assumption, then a lot of things flow from that. And Bill and Melinda, as well as my children, because I have foundations for each one of my th three children that are of significant size. They, and you can read the letters I wrote them up on the Berkshire Hathaway website. I, I do not direct them to do anything, but I do tell them to swing for the fences. I tell them if they succeed at everything they do in philanthropy, they're doing the wrong things right. because the, the important things are the tough ones and you're gonna fail at some of those. But I have got much younger people, very energetic people, common objectives, and they work for nothing. So <laughs> that's, that's not a bad deal, Brian. Right? <laughs> like, that, that stretches the money a long way. Right? It, it, yeah, absolutely. And, and the way I read it is that you require them to actually move the money out the other they, side they of got, the got They so. got they to spend it. And, and, and when I die, uh, all of the money has to be spent within 10 years after the estate is closed because I do not think that I can pick out some little great-great-grandchild yet to be born, you know, just because he has the right name, a Buffett right, or right. she has the right name, uh, and they will be the best custodians. I mean, there'll be plenty of philanthropists 50 years after I die to take care of the problems of 50 years, but I want the money to get spent promptly, and, and, and I don't believe in trying to control things from the grave. I mean, I, I like to think I can think outside the box, but thinking outside of that particular <laughs> box. <laughs> That may take a lot of philanthropy to figure it out. <laughs> but, um, recently, I read an article uh, about East Lake and, and Tom Cousins. So this week, the, as many people know, the PGA finishes up his tournament at East Lake, which is a golf course in Atlanta. And, and the story I read about the development is that you've now helped Tom Cousins in, his, in the, in the uh, development work he does with communities. So talk a little about that, because that's a little different than this type of thing. Yeah, but it's the same theory of loving to back people who are putting their own time and energy and, and who are successful in, in, into a project that's worthwhile. Tom Cousins is a remarkable man who lives in Atlanta, uh, just extraordinary. And uh, uh, he took this terrible, terrible neighborhood called East Lake in Atlanta and against a lot of community opposition, everything it was, it was, it was crime ridden and nobody did it well in school and everything else. And he decided you had to apply, to apply a holistic approach to it and, and, and you couldn't just attack this thing or that thing. And, and so he, he worked for probably 10 years to develop this entirely new community out of this total disaster. And then Tom and I talked about it, and I said, Tom, you know, everybody's gonna say that that's only be, it can only be done because you're Tom Cousins and you live in Atlanta and you've done this. So uh, he and I and a fellow named Julian Robertson, but primarily Tom, uh, decided to see if we could replicate this in other communities. And it seemed to me that, and, and Tom, that New Orleans was a great one to do it. I mean, they've been wrapped by this like Katrina and everything. So, so uh, we've taken it, to, we've taken it to, to New Orleans where we've got hundreds of people. And these, it's, it's mixed income type uh, a community. I mean, we do, we do not want to have it with everybody being subsidized. We, we, we want to create a new kind of community that where people of different races, different economic conditions work together and play together. And it's been successful in New Orleans. We went to Indianapolis, it's been successful there. And we've got about 11 more towns we're working on now. And so uh, uh, Tom Cousins has really, he has really come up with something. He had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago describing this, but he's a fantastic human being. And when you get a chance to, to join forces with somebody that as, as high quality as that and energetic and smart and putting his own funds in it, you know, you just got to jump at the chance. That's true. Let's, uh, we'll switch to the economy now. What's going on and, and move from philanthropy to the economy uh, that you create your wealth off of, that you can do these wonderful, great things with. So what do you see in the economy and, and what you're seeing in your companies, your operating companies and from an investor's point? Well, our, our company, business has come back very well from five years ago when the panic hit. And it was a panic like nobody's ever seen. I mean, whatever you think about it, it was worse. Uh, uh, I, I'm dead serious about that. We were right on the edge of the cliff. Uh, and fortunately, I give enormous credit to uh, uh, both Ben Bernanke uh, and Hank Paulson and, and uh, Tim Geithner. And, and frankly, even though I didn't vote for him, never voted for him, uh, President Bush, uh, uh, 
you know, I don't know how many of you have studied economics, but in Adam Smith, they talk about comparative advantage and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, Keynes talked about animal spirits and all those people. But President Bush really came out with the great economic insight of all times, and he did it in 10 words in September of 2008. He went out there from the White House and he said, if money doesn't loosen up, this sucker could go down. And I mean, that, that goes right up there. Tear down those plaques of Adam Smith. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he backed up, he backed up those fellows. And, and so it, we've come back from it, but businesses come back, you know, a lot of companies are having record profits, including many of ours. And the American populace as a whole has not come back. I mean, the inequality is getting wider. The, the Forbes 400, which just came out, showed aggregate wealth for the Forbes 400 of $2 trillion. You go back 20 years, and that was $300 billion. So it's up six or seven for one. It's different people to some extent, but this is the top. $300 billion to $2 trillion. And if you read the paper today, you'd have seen that the median income, you know, is the same place it was in terms of real purchasing power. Uh, from 1989, it hasn't changed. So it's, the inequality is getting wider. Uh, the rich are doing extremely well, extraordinarily well. Uh, and uh, business is doing well. Business profit margins are terrific compared to the record historically. Business returns on tangible equity are terrific. Uh, but most, you know, a great many people in our country, if you take the bottom 20% of households, that's 20, 24 million households or something like that, housing, you know, close to six, about 60 million people, you know, it's, the top level is $22,000. Know, I don't want to try to live on $22,000 with a couple of kids. So it, we've, got, we've got an economy that is delivering $50,000 of GDP per capita and we've got an awful lot of people who aren't living well. So uh, we, we have learned how to turn out lots of goods and services, but we haven't learned as well how to have everybody share in the, in the bounty that we have. So how do, how do you think, is that that we just got to grow out of it to, to provide? Well, we're growing. We're, we're growing. Yeah. I mean, if you take even 2% a year, if you think about it, people feel very unhappy with 2% a year, but the population grows 1% a year. So that means 1% per capita real growth. That means in 20 years, a generation, there's a 20% gain. In, 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 in GDP per capita. That's not bad in a generation. Right. And, but the question is how it gets distributed. Right. But this country will, this system works. You know, in my lifetime, I was born in 1930. I was conceived in 1929 because my dad was a stock salesman and, and uh, after the crash, he didn't have anything to do. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> yeah. So I, I look back with great fondness on the 1929 crash, but. Since, since 1930, since I was born in 1930, real GDP per capita has increased six for one. Just think of that, six for one. I mean, you went centuries when nothing happened right. for, for, for people. And it, this, this, this country works. I mean, I consider the luckiest person on a probabilistic basis that ever lived is the baby that's born today in the United States. I mean. It, 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 it is a fabulous country, and the market system works all kinds of things. But we, we do have to, in my view, we have to make sure that everybody participates to a reasonable degree. We don't want equality of results, but we also want a base level that's, that's, that's satisfactory for our people. So you, you talked about the George Bush's statement, economic statement about it <laughs> that could go down. Um, what, do you, what do you think the lessons are of the last couple of cycles that you've seen from an investor standpoint? We've got a, young, a lot of young kids out there. You've lived through multiple cycles in the, in the uh, 50, 60 years plus you've been yeah. doing, investing, yeah. 70 years, 70 years investing, yeah. investing. What are the lessons and what, you know, these are young people, what should they take away? The, the, the lessons are that people will continue to make the same mistakes they've made. I mean, it, humans, and when, it, it, it doesn't correlate to IQ particularly. I mean, they, when, they get, when they get greedy, and we had this huge bubble in the most important asset the American public has housing. I mean, so you had a huge bubble in something that you could borrow heavily against. So you could run a margin account effect on a house instead of stocks, and, and the conditions got very lax. And so when that bubble popped, but people came into that gradually. When they get fearful, it happens all at once. I mean, when everybody wants, 
when people get scared, they all want to leave at one time. And we had them all want to leave at one time, and we'll ha that'll happen again. It'll happen with a different set of circumstances, but, but uh, the human animal uh, will keep behaving pretty much the way it has in the past. So we will have periodic uh, recessions. We'll have an occasional panic, which doesn't all, all recessions don't come from panics. But, uh, uh, but the good news is, if you look at the 20th century, in the 20th century, we had two world wars. We had the Great Depression. We had the flu epidemic. We had the, we had the Cold War. We had the atom bomb, you name it. The Dow Jones average went from 66 to 11,497, you know, with all these terrible things happening, supposedly, at various times. America works. And uh, well, I, when I bought my first stock when I was 11, that was in the spring of 1942. And that was a couple months after Pearl Harbor. And we were getting clobbered in the Pacific at Corregidor and Bataan, I mean, the death march of Bataan. And, and in, in, in the European theater, the, the Blitz of England was on. And, but, and the Dow was at about 100. But just look at where we are now. I mean, the, the country really works. Uh, the trick is, I mean, uh, it seems to me the obligation of a society as prosperous as, as ours is to figure out how n nobody gets left too far behind. Right. That was interesting because at last year with Bono's speech was a lot about how America is a society of dreams and you can accomplish more here. And it was actually one of the best speeches about the optimism America should, could have by a person who's not American by birth. So it was, it, and I know you carry that optimism. So after all this, how do you, how do you, how, what makes you most optimistic for the next decade about America? Well, or next just, I mean, just imagine, you know, 1789, just go back just a few hundred years. There wasn't anything here, you know, <laughs> I mean, in this country. And, and you know, the, Sir, Sir Christopher Wren, I think, you know, the, the Zion St. Paul's Cathedral is buried there, and there's a, there's a little plaque there, and it says, you know, if you seek my monument, look about you. Well, I say if you, in, in America, if you, if you seek America's monument, look about you. This, this country has all come about in a few hundred years. We had less than four million people, you know, when we became a country. China had 300 million people at that time. Europe had about 75 million. They were just as smart as we were. They worked just as hard as we did. They had natural resources that were similar to ours, and yet we ended up with a quarter of the world GDP, you know, a few hundred years later. Now, we've got something that works, and we don't want to mess that up. Uh, we want to figure out what we do with this abundance better as we go along. But, but you don't have to worry about the system working. But you will have, you will have periodic recessions, and you will have an occasional panic brought on by something that who knows where it comes from, you know, at, uh, and. Uh, the thing to remember at that time, I wrote an op-ed piece in, in, in the New York Times in, in the fall of 2008, and I said, you know, that, that uh, the country will come back. You know, it'll go through a big recession and everything, but it'll come back, and it's coming back. So don't ever worry about America. It'll tell you, you're in the right place. <laughs> so you've been famous for your investment strategy, on, uh, basically that follows the opposite side of that principles, invest when the, the chips are down and write it up. Um, that served you well. So what's your favorite? Your favorite uh, time that you were able to accomplish that when you cut somebody down and and and, uh, and moved well, up. I, I I always think my favorite time's gonna be tomorrow. You know, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I, but I it it's it's always been fun. You know, and and uh, there's a company here in, in in Washington called Geico. You know, and I I first got exposed to that in 1950. I was I was tw 20 years. I was 19 years. Or, well, it was 51. I'm sorry. So I was 20 years old, and uh, I came down here and. And I came down on a Saturday uh, because I'd learned that my professor who I worshiped at Columbia named Ben Graham was the chairman. I got down here and the door was locked. And I went to the building because it was Saturday and I pounded on the door and some janitor let me in and a marvelous fellow named Lorimer Davidson uh, spent four hours with me teaching me all about insurance. And he, he helped me so much in life. You're gonna, get, you're gonna get help by some wonderful people in life. It's, it's a great thing to to remember later on when you get to be my age that you know, all the help you've received from different people because uh, uh, you know, nobody does it alone. Obama got in trouble when he said that in the campaign that you know, nobody does it by themselves. Nobody does do it by themselves. We all sit in the shade of trees that were planted by others. So it's obligatory, I think, to plant a few trees ourselves if we've had good luck. Uh, uh, it's, it's been a great ride, but it's not over. <laughs> you've owned when did you actually buy Geico? The, when, did you, when did you invest in Geico the first time? Is well, Geico, I bought, I, I met Norma Davidson 
And when I was, I was finishing up in Columbia, and, this, and then I started selling securities when I got out. And I went out to my Aunt Alice, and my Aunt Alice would have bought anything from me. And so I, she bought 100 shares of government employees insurance. It was the first stock I ever sold. And uh, uh, then a lot of years passed, and Mr. Davidson was very kind to me in a variety of ways. But I went, you know, I went in different directions. And then in 1976, the company got in big trouble because they miscalculated their reserves, and they were going broke. And so I came back here, and I, I bought a third of the company in the market in a very short period of time. And then in 1995, by now our third had become a half because they'd repurchased their shares. And I went out to see Mr. Davidson, who was, was out in Bethesda, who was 96 or 97, and he had a bunch of stock in Geico with no cost basis because he'd held it forever. And I said, Davey, if I make an offer for this company for cash, you're gonna pay a big tax. And of course, if you die with the stock, you don't have that tax and you get a stepped up basis, so I'm not gonna make this offer unless it's all right with you. And, and he said to me, he said, Warren, he said, I've, been, I've hoped for this all my life. And so we bought the rest of the company. It was, he was a great man. That's, that's terrific. Well, let's... Uh I bought a book in 1949 by a fellow named Ben Graham called The Intelligent Investor. I don't remember what I paid, but aside from what I paid for my two marriage licenses, that was the best investment I ever made. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's very important to have the right framework. You need, you, need, you need to have an approach to investing that's sound. And, and Graham's approach is, is simple, uh, but some people, uh, adopt to it, and, 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 uh, which I did immediately, and, and most people don't. Um, but if you have the right philosophy, you will find opportunities uh, as you go through the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and frankly, you're most likely to find them uh, when in periods like five years ago when we were having the panic. I mean, uh, uh, stocks sell at silly prices from time to time, most stocks at one time or another sell at very silly prices. Uh, and it doesn't take a high IQ to figure out that they're cheap, but it does take a temperament that's willing to step up and actually act. Uh, I tell people, if they're going in the investment business, if you've got 160 IQ, sell 30 points to somebody else because you won't need it. I mean, that, <laughs> that it, 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 I mean, I figured out very early, you don't have to be that smart in this business, which is fortunate, but you do have to have the right temperament, and you have to be able to ignore what other people are saying and, and sell a stock tip. No names. <laughs> I'll make it simple. Just buy Bank of America, and you'll be set. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It worked all right for him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> the, uh, next question, sir. Um, good afternoon. That's what makes my job interesting. I mean, uh, I'm, 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 I'm not kidding. I mean... If you went out and played golf and every drive went in the hole, you'd give up. The game wouldn't be interesting. I mean, it, it, what, what's interesting is when you get in the rough and have to come out and a few things like that. So I, I love the fact that I don't know what I'm going to do next. You mentioned the Israel investment. In 2006, in the fall, I got a letter from a fellow, and I never heard of him, and I never heard of the company he was talking about. But he said, my name is Eitan Wertheimer. And I want to tell you a little about my company, Ishkar. The letter was a page and a half long. And he said, if he sold the company, the family sold the company, the only company they wanted to sell it to was Berkshire Hathaway. And if I was interested, they'd be glad to come over from Israel and explain it to me. And it, was a, it just jumped off the page that, it was, that this was an interesting idea. So I emailed them, and they came over very shortly, and, and we bought the business. We, we handed them... $4 billion for 80% of a company where I'd never seen it or anything. Aton kept saying, you got to come over to Israel and see the plants and everything. You, you won't believe how wonderful they are. And I said, Aton, I don't go to Council Bluffs, Iowa. You know, I mean, this, uh, 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 I am doing fine in Omaha. And uh, he said, no, you know, you got to see it. I said, no, no, I, I don't. I, I said, we can make a deal without seeing it. He said, well, if you, buy the, if you buy the company, will you come and see it? I said, if we buy the company, I'll come. So we bought the company. And I went over there, and it's true. I've never seen plants like this. It was the greatest operation I've ever seen. And Aton said to me, he said, you know, that, that's why I want you to come over to see these things. I said, listen, Aton, if I'd come and seen them, I'd have paid more money. So, I <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, we, 
we have a wonderful partnership with the people in Israel. But I don't know tomorrow. Uh, our partnership with the people in Brazil, with Georgie Paolo Lemon and his associates, they are sensational people. Uh, I got to know Georgie Paolo when I was on the board of Gillette with him. And the opportunity to buy into a wonderful business like Heinz and to be partners, and they do, they, they'll do all the heavy lifting. They're, they run the place uh, with Georgie Paolo and his associates. I mean, it, it's just... It, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us. And I don't know what the opportunity will be tomorrow. With Georgie Paolo, as last December, uh, I was going out to Boulder, Colorado, where he had a group that met. And he said, I think I've got an idea might interest you when I get out there. And so I went out there. And, and, uh, and as we came back on the plane, he explained what he was thinking about in terms of Heinz. And I said, count me in. And, uh, uh, and I will tell you one other thing, which is quite impressive about him. After I said that and went a little, a little further in the thing, he sent me a one-page governance description of how it wor would work between the two of us, and he sent me a very brief description of what he thought would be a fair deal for both of us. I didn't have to change a word. I mean, those are the kind of people. October of 2008, there were some extraordinary things done. The Federal Reserve poured $85 billion into AIG, and if they hadn't, our world would be very different. Uh, Hank Paulson guaranteed money market funds at a time when 30 million Americans with money market funds were panicking and when 300 billion in three days had gone out of the non-government money market funds, 125 of it had gone back into the government. 300 billion, that was, that was almost equal to the deposits of Wells Fargo or Wachovia at the time, which were then two separate institutions. Both of those authorities have essentially been take, they, I don't think they can do that under Don Frank. I, think they, uh, I don't think that Bernanke could do what he did, and I don't think that Paulson can do it, what, what he and Paulson. And finally, Congress, in a kind of a reluctant way, but said to the American public, and you could believe it, if Bernanke said, I'm going to do whatever it takes, nobody knows what Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act is, and it wasn't probably meant to do what he did with it, but he did it. And the same way with the, they called it the Exchange Stabilization Fund, of the, of the Treasury. Nobody, it was enacted back in 1934. Nobody dreamt it would be used to take care of money market funds. But you had these strong characters who had the ability to print money in the case of Bernanke, and they said, we're going to do whatever it takes. And the president was behind them. That is the way you end a real panic. And, and I, I worry, actually, that, that you know Congress doesn't like to give anybody that much authority, and it bothers them that the Fed has all this authority or that Paulson acted as he did in TARP. And I tip my hat to them, and I, I, I'm not sure. There will be another panic. You know, where it comes from, who knows? But when that time comes, the question will be, are the people who have panicked, who have frozen, who have caused the economic engine to stop, you know, will they believe and come right back and be doing something? And I'm not sure whether the, what's been enacted is a plus or a minus in that regard. Regardless, the, comp the country will come through. But we, uh, it's very hard to write regulations that will keep people from acting foolishly, particularly when acting foolishly has been proven very profitable over the preceding few years. It's just, it's just the way it works. Humans, you know, they, they, they all think they're Cinderella at the ball, you know, and they think, you know, as the night goes along, the music gets better and the drinks flow and everything, and they think they're going, all going, they all think they're going to leave at two minutes to 12. And of course, there's no clocks on the wall, and they're still dancing. So it'll happen again. But bye when it happens. <laughs> Next question. There is a very, I think, structural problem as a market system gets more and more specialized. If you go back to an agrarian society like we had a couple hundred years ago with most people working on a farm, most people felt fit most job requirements. I mean, it was that, that as the world has become more and more specialized, uh, I think we keep moving away from that. So a market system will not pay well for a significant percentage of society. They, they aren't needed to keep GDP itself going up and, and people at the top. And I think government has to address that. that uh, it, I think it's, I, 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 I sometimes toss out to students this proposition. Imagine that it's 24 hours 
before you're born. And you're sitting there, Johnny or Joni, we don't know yet, and you're in the womb, and the genie comes. And the genie says, John or Joni, you strike me as a remarkable potential human being. And I'm going to give you an enormous responsibility. I'm going to let you decide the world, how the world is going to work into which you're going to emerge. You can decide on the economic system, the social system, the political system. You design it. And whatever you design, that's going to be the system in which you live, your children live, your grandchildren live. And you, being wise beyond your minus 24 hours of age, say, I know all about you genies. What's the catch? And the genie says there's one catch. Just before you emerge, having designed the system, put it in cement, you're going to go over to that barrel over there that has seven billion slips in it, one for every hu human being in the world, and you're going to pull out a slip. It may say male, it may say female, it may say white, it may say black, it may say infirm, it may say, it may say strong, it may say bright, it may say, it may say uh, below average. Uh, it may say United States, it may say Bangladesh. Now, not knowing which ticket you're going to pull out, what kind of a world do you want to design? Well, you certainly want to design a world that produces lots of goods and services and keeps producing more and more. You want a lot of stuff around. It could be the world's fairest society, but if it's on a barren desert island, it isn't going to do anybody good. So you really want something that works in terms of output. But once you have something that works in, kind of, in terms of output, you, know, you certainly want something that eliminates fear from everybody's life. Now, that doesn't just mean a lot of cops. It means fear of old age, fear of health, all of those problems. And you certainly want a system not knowing what tickets you're going to get that takes care of the people that don't survive so well in that market system, which, mar which maximizes the amount of output, your first goal. And I think we've done a wonderful job at the first stage. We have learned out, how to turn out lots of stuff. We have not thought as much, although we've thought a fair amount. I mean, when Social Security came in and all of that, I mean, this country has developed in terms of thinking about how a rich family should behave. But we have not, I think we are in the stage where we need to focus more on making sure that the people who get the bad tickets do better uh, than they are. And, you know, we said that blacks were three-fifths or slaves were three-fifths of a person back when we started and said, you know, we said all men are created equal in 1776, and in 1789, we said blacks are three-fifths of a person. You know, we said, we not only said all men are created equal, but in the Gettysburg Address, you know, Lincoln repeated it. It was 1920 before we passed the 19th Amendment for, for women, so we just, we, we treated women as an essentially different class for all those years. So I think we've got, I think we've gone in significantly in the right direction in terms of behaving better as a society, and I think we've gone terrifically in the right direction in terms of turning out lots of stuff, but I think we have to address the question of how do you treat the people that are left behind in a system that maximizes the output of goods and services. Because he's going to keep doing it until he sees more improvement in the economy, and I think he's been mildly disappointed, uh, in, in, not hugely disappointed, but mildly disappointed in the rate of improvement uh, in the economy uh, in the last few years, and therefore, just the other day, he said he's going to ex you know, extend it further until he sees it. So he's, he's not prejudging exactly when it's going to happen. He's telling you the conditions under which he'll, he'll change, and the economy is getting better. We are in, 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 a, in an experiment which hasn't really been tried before. I mean, we, you know, we have a, Fed has a three and a half trillion dollar balance sheet and, and uh, uh, buying securities is usually easier than selling securities, <laughs> sometimes people find out. So uh, we don't know how this game plays out. Uh, and just the announcement, whenever it was a few months ago, or the hint that, that tapering was going to occur, you know, that had some significant market reactions, probably 100 basis points or so in the tenure. And what will happen when it when they actually, if, if they actually try to deleverage the Fed, I mean, what has happened is the American public deleveraged and the, and the government leveraged up through the Fed. When the Fed, if the Fed deleverages that in any big way, that will be, that will be a new experiment. And, uh,
But Warren, as we were talking earlier, the, the question is, when they do that, the economy has to be growing faster. The economy has, and the has piece, to be doing the, well. And the piece people don't take into account is they, they're clear that they're going to stay there until the economy grows it, faster. Say, so and he has no pressure on them. In fact, you know, the Fed is the greatest hedge fund in history. I mean, you've got a trillion one financed by currency and circulation, which doesn't cost anything, and they got about a trillion eight or nine for the banks at 25 basis points. And I mean, the Fed is going to make 80 billion or something like that. The Fed is the fourth largest contributor to the United States government's revenues uh, that there is now. That wasn't the case a few years back, but it's 80 or 90 billion a year probably. And, so, and it is under no pressure, there's none whatsoever, to have to deleverage. So it can pick its time, and, and if you have somebody wise there, and I think Bernanke's wise, and I, I, and I certainly expect his successor to be, uh, it, it can be handled. But it is, it is something that's never quite been done on this scale. It'll be interesting to watch. No, it, it, it will be, and we've seen a lesson in the market moving ahead and back just based on uh, uh, the last 30 days. So I think we're going to take one more question and then... Uh, Your capacity to evaluate. You don't have to be right about thousands and thousands and thousands of companies. You only have to be right about a company, couple. I'm, I met Bill Gates on July 5th, 1991. We were out in Seattle, and Bill said, you've got to have a computer. And I said, why? And he said, <laughs> well, he said, you can do your income tax on it. I said, I don't have any income. Berkshire doesn't pay a dividend. Uh, he said, well, you can keep track of your portfolio. Right. And I said, I only have one stock. I said, I, I mean. <laughs> uh, and he says, it's going to change everything. And I said, well, will it change whether people chew gum? And he said, well, probably not. And I said, well, will it change what kind of gum they chew? And not. And I said, well, then I'll stick to chewing gum and you stick to computers. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't have to understand all kinds of business. There's all kinds of business I don't understand. But there's thousands of opportunities there. I did understand the Bank of America, you know, and, 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 uh, and I'll be able, I, I'm, I'm able to do that. Uh, I'm able to understand some given percentage. But Ted Williams wrote a book called The Science of Hitting. And in The Science of Hitting, he's got a diagram, shows him at the plate. And he's got the strike zone divided into 77 squares, each the size of a baseball. And he says, if I only swing at pitches in my sweet zone, which he shows there, and he has what his batting average would be, which is 400. If he had to swing at low outside pitches, but still in the, in the strike zone, his average would be 230. He said the most important thing in hitting is waiting for the right pitch. Now, he was at a disadvantage because if the count was 0-2 or 1-2 and or so on, even if that ball was down where he was only going to bat 230, he had to swing at it. In investing, there's no called strikes. People can throw Microsoft at me and, you know, you, you name it, any, any stock, General Motors, uh, and I don't have to swing. And nobody's going to call me out on called strikes. I only get a strike called if I swing at a pitch and miss. So I can wait there and look at thousands of companies day after day, and only when I see something I understand and when I like the price at which it's selling, then if I swing, if I, if I hit it fine, if I miss it, 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 it it's, it's, it's a strike. But it's an enormously advantageous game. And it's a terrible mistake to think you have to have an opinion on everything. You only have to have an opinion on a few things. In fact, I've told students, if when they got out of school, they got a punch card with 20 punches on it, and that's all the investment decisions they got to make in their entire life, they would get very rich because they would think very hard about each one. And you don't need 20 right decisions to get very rich. You know, four or five will probably do it over time. So uh, I don't worry too much about the things I don't understand. If you understand some of these businesses that are coming along and can spot things on, if you, if you can spot on Amazon, for example, I mean, it's a tremendous accomplishment what Jeff Bezos has done. And I tip my hat to him. He's a wonderful businessman. He's a good guy, too. But could I have anticipated that he would be the success and 10 others wouldn't be? I'm not good enough to do that. But I don't, fortunately, I don't have to. You know, I, I don't have to form an opinion on, on Amazon. And I, do, I did form an opinion on the Bank of America. And I formed an opinion on Coca-Cola. I mean, Coca-Cola's been around since 1886. There's 1 1.8 billion 1.8 billion eight ounce servings of Coca-Cola products sold every day. Now, if you take one penny and get one penny extra, that's $18 million a day. And 18 million 
times 365 is 7 billion three less 730 billion or, or, or 6 billion 570 million dollars. So annually 6 billion 570 million dollars from one penny. Do you think Coca-Cola is worth a penny more than you know Joe's Cola? I think so. So, uh, you know, and I've got about 127 years of history that would indicate it. So those are the kind of decisions I like to make. And you may have an entirely different field of expertise than I would have, and probably much more up to date in terms of the kind of businesses that we're seeing evolve. And you can get very rich if you just understand a few of them and, and, and understand their future. But fortunately, I don't have to. I mean, if we go into Heinz, you know, and I, I look at people pouring ketchup on, you know, uh, hamburgers and potatoes, I don't think it's going to change. You know, and, and, uh, uh, and the nice thing about it, some products travel. Some products don't travel. Candy bars don't travel well. I mean, if you look at the Cadbury bars in England, they don't sell well here. And if you look at the Hershey bars here, they don't sell as well someplace else. Soft drinks travel and ketchup travels. I like products that travel. <laughs> well, thank so, you. Okay. Thank you.